Welcome to all of you who are joining us today uh, to this virtual conversation with the Dean. Today, we're lucky to be joined by Professor Tom McDade. Thomas McDade is the Carlos Montezuma Professor of Anthropology at Weinberg College and a fellow of the Institute for Policy Research at Northwestern. Tom was recently elected to the prestigious National Academy of Sciences, as well as the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Much of his work focuses on the long-term effects of early environments and the integration of biological measures into population-based social science research. He's director of the Laboratory for Human Biology Research, which has as its central mission, the development and application of minimally invasive methods for studying human biology and health in a diverse community-based settings around the world. At the start of COVID, Tom and his team received $200,000 in a grant from the National Science Foundation Rapid Grant uh, Program to develop scientific insights into COVID with a minimally invasive and community-based approach. And I'm really excited, as I'm sure you are, to hear more about where he is with this research today. So Tom, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and nice to see you. So let me just jump into our questions. Uh, Tom, before we get into your work that touches directly on COVID, can you tell us a bit more about your research in general and your career before the pandemic? What were you working on? What are the things that motivated your research? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I joined the faculty here at Northwestern in 2000, which you know it just seems incredible that, that I'm just wrapping up my 21st year here uh, and that our undergrads you know, weren't even born um, the year I started. That just you know blows my mind, but um, I try not to think about that too much. Um, in my uh, research and teaching prior to the pandemic, um, I, was, I was primarily focused on trying to advance our understanding of how, how you might say experience becomes biology, how it is that where you live, the environments that you're exposed to, the quality of your social relationships, your access to resources, um, how those affect your physiology, literally get under your skin to shape your physiological systems, how they function, and ultimately how they affect your growth, your development, and then your health as we age. Um, I came perilously close to going to medical school after college. I had uh, you know, the great privilege of attending a wonderful four-year liberal arts college, Pomona College, where I discovered anthropology, um, but I was pre-med bio major all the way. So you'll see when we talk that um, I borrow a lot of methods and ideas uh, uh, and concepts from laboratory medicine and, and clinical sciences more generally, but I apply them in different settings. I'm not so much interested in the diagnosis and treatment of disease at the individual level. I'm interested in how broader uh, patterns of exposures and environments and behaviors and groups of people shape their physiology and shape their health. Um, now, before the pandemic, uh, uh, most of my work was focused on inflammation, chronic inflammation. And um, uh, chronic inflammation, many of you may, may know, is um, a, a problem in the United States and many countries around the world. And it contributes to cardiovascular disease, diabetes, dementia, basically all the things that do us in as we age have chronic and dysregulated inflammation as an underlying pathophysiological part of that process. So then the question for me is why are some people or some groups of people more likely to be chronically inflamed than others? So I've been doing research on this question in a variety of global contexts um, in various ways. Uh, I did my dissertation research in Samoa in the South Pacific. I've done research in the highlands of Kenya. Uh, um, I have a, a project in the Amazon basin of Bolivia. And most recently I've been working primarily in the Philippines trying to look at how that where people live, how they live, how that shapes their physiology, particularly how they regulate inflammation. I think we made some important um, contributions to our understanding, particularly about how nutritional and microbial infectious exposures early in life shape the regulation of inflammation later in life. I had a couple of studies in motion um, to explore those factors, but they all got shut down because of um, COVID, obviously. So I'm looking forward to restarting that research agenda in the upcoming year. That's terrific. And I think maybe for the audience and maybe for me as well, could you say a word about, because when I think of anthropology, when I took anthropology in university, it wasn't this type of work. Could you just say a, a little bit before we get to your actual yeah. research about bioanthropology and how it's transformed your field and your discipline? Yeah. 
It's a great question. I mean, when I introduce myself as an anthropologist, most people say, well, that's not the kind of anthropology I took in college, right? And so there are four main subfields of anthropology. One is cultural anthropology, which most people are familiar with. There's archaeology, sort of a historical perspective. Um, there's uh, linguistic anthropology, the study of language and culture and context. And then there's biological anthropology. And a lot of research in biological anthropology has to do with human evolution and human origins. A lot of it has to do with primatology, comparing us to other non-human primates. And then there's a subdiscipline within that called human biology, which is fundamentally interested in understanding how you know the experiences people have in different contexts around that world, how it shapes their physiology, and that's where I fit in. And we're one, we're incredibly lucky here at Northwestern to have one of the strongest programs, if not, I would argue, the strongest program in human biology. Um, where that is our primary focus here, and it's a great opportunity, great privilege to work with the students, many of whom are pre-med, which is great. They go off and become um, better doctors, I think, for having a lot of the courses that we offer in human biology. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a wonderful place to do the kind of work that I do. Yes, yeah, terrific. Thank you. Because I know, I mean, I got used to it, having met you and others, you know, some of your right. colleagues, but I think it comes as a bit of a surprise to people that bioanthropology is such a big and emerging field. And it really is like one of our lab sciences uh, at this point in uh, a social science department. Now, a year ago, you received this rapid grant that I mentioned before from the NSF that's yielded results that are very, very relevant today. And I think as we're reading the newspaper almost every morning, we're reading about some of these terms, herd immunity, vaccines, et cetera. Could you talk a little bit before you get to the results about what was your motivation to engage with the crisis as it was emerging? Yeah. Well, you know, it's been interesting the past couple of months, I've been trying to remind myself what it was like a year ago, a year ago, March, a year ago, April, like right now I'm back in my office, I'm fully vaccinated, you know, things feel like they're starting to open up, at least here in Emerson. Um, but a year ago, you know, it couldn't have been further from, from that um, case. And so once, once I got my footing under me, once, you know, I realized that this sort of shelter in place situation was going to go on for months, it wasn't just a two week phenomenon. Once we figured out how to, you know, get our basic needs met and our two school age kids, once we sort of start to figure out that situation, I realized that my skills as an anthropologist, my lab here, the things I was interested in um, were relevant to the pandemic, particularly with respect to, to testing for antibodies and immunity. And once I made that realization, um, it was it was actually, I think, wonderful for my mental health to be able to engage productively and scientifically in the moment, whereas friends and colleagues and family members were sort of more in panic mode. I was certainly had that phase, but to be able to work productively on this topic and use my expertise was great. Um, and as an anthropologist who does field-based research in you know uh, settings all around the world, I'm used to dealing with challenges and adversity in the field. I rarely do research in a controlled clinical laboratory setting. I take my methods and my ideas and my sort of my projects into the field where people are rather than drawing them into my lab or to the clinic. So I was in some ways sort of primed to deal with the challenges of the moment. Um, and that was, I think, a, a nice convergence. That's terrific. And I think, you know, naming the places you've been, clearly you're used to very different settings than uh, just the clinical antiseptic places we usually work. Yeah. So could you tell us then a little bit about what you did and how you're doing it and you know how many people are working with you on this sort of what does it look like to do the type of uh, work that was funded by the rapid grant yeah so early on a key a key part of this that made this possible um, was uh, a collaborative relationship that started early on with colleagues at Feinberg in our in our medical school and um, you know I had this idea I wanted to develop a minimally invasive, finger prick based tests for um, COVID antibodies, which I'll, I can describe in more detail in a minute with some visuals, if you'd like to see that. Um, and I knew I had the expertise in the lab to do that, but uh, I was missing a key supply. There was one sort of piece of that uh, lab work, uh, a key a piece of the virus that I needed to source. And we couldn't get anything here. The, literally the shipping room, the, all the buildings were closed. There was one point in the middle of campus where shipments were coming irregularly from FedEx and UPS. I had to find that and, and you know, sweet talk the guys and they let me in to get stuff. 
But I found a colleague, a couple of colleagues at the medical school who are interested in doing the same thing, but in a more traditional clinical context. They wanted to draw venous blood, you know, blood from the arm with a big needle and do serology, test for antibodies. And a lot of labs were doing this at the time. My, the thing that I wanted to do that was different is I wanted to do these finger prick blood spot samples that I'll describe in a second. And they had the virus, they had the piece, the antigen is called the piece of the virus that I needed. And they said, let's work together on this. Um, it was the easiest, fastest collaboration I've ever had come together. And it's, I think it's a unique Northwestern moment. And still to this day, I have not seen most of these people in person. Mm -hmm. um, most of them I did not know. Uh, I knew a couple, Brian Mastansky, um, I knew at the medical school, Rich Daquila, I knew, but I didn't know Alex DeMombran, Beth McNally. These are folks down in our medical school in the Center for Genetic Medicine. Um, and uh, uh, I've only seen them once in person, um, but we have this wonderful weekly meeting and this great camaraderie. And this whole thing wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for their open-mindedness and willingness to uh, collaborate. That's terrific. So how does it actually work? And what did you find out? Yeah, maybe, can I share, share some slides? Absolutely. I think uh, some visuals might help here. Okay, so, you know, a year ago, the world closed. And as we were just talking, um, I, uh, I sort of got my head around how in my lab, I could sort of engage this moment and do some productive and interesting science that might actually have some public benefit. And the result was a study, screening for coronavirus antibodies in neighborhoods, we call it SCAN. And um, uh, what really launched the study was this rapid award from NSF that we applied for and fortunate enough to get. We also got some seed money from the Office of Research here at Northwestern, which was really key to getting us started. And the SCAN is a, is a, um, a seroprevalence study. And early on in the pandemic, the idea that antibody testing could help us inform the response to the pandemic was out there. The New York Times was writing about this a lot. This is a, a, an article in the, in the journal Science, top science journal. And basically people were talking about antibody testing as being interesting for a number of reasons. One is that we had a hard time tracing the, the, the infection and the spread of the virus in the community because we didn't know very well how it was transmitted. Um, and uh, testing for the virus was very limited in supply. You may recall a year ago, it was hard to get tested. And a lot of very sick people never got confirmed um, uh, PCR tests for the virus. But an antibody leaves a detectable trace of your exposure for months at a time, which I'll, I can describe in more detail in a minute. So even if you're not actively sick, we can determine whether you had been previously exposed to the virus. And that's very useful for solving what, what some people were calling the denominator problem, just how many people were exposed to this virus and what were the factors that were producing um, outbreaks in some communities and preventing them in other, others. And that knowledge is very important for informing policies, right? And you can think about shelter in place orders and those shutdown orders as just a sledgehammer, just the world came grinding to a halt. What if we knew better what more specific behaviors and contexts and actions led to the transmission of the virus versus others? We could take a more tactical surgical approach to preventing spread in the community. So antibody testing can, can, form, can inform that. Also, one of the interesting things about the pandemic, and I'll talk about this in a second, um, is that the, um, a huge proportion of the, the infections are actually asymptomatic, which is one of the reasons why it spread, seems to spread so readily in the community. And then really the majority of infections are relatively mild or asymptomatic. So we can use antibody, use antibody testing to pick up on those asymptomatic infections, document them, but also help us understand what predicts whether someone has a mild or more severe case of COVID-19. And then now, unfortunately, we're starting to see that there are some long-term consequences of infection for some people, long haul COVID. So antibody testing might give us some insights into that. Sadly, um, and to me, this is just a tragedy of uh, how the pandemic unfolded um, uh, in the sense that it became overly politicized early on, um, whereas we had an opportunity to sort of rally around and, uh, the pandemic and come together. But antibody testing does have the potential to become politicized because some people want to say there are more cases that, or other people want to say there are fewer cases. Uh, there's the talk, talk of using antibody testing as an immunity pass, passport. We're having some of those similar conversations right now about vaccines. So there are some downsides to, um, to these kinds of, of, of measures, and we have to be careful how they're interpreted. So mm -hmm. this is just a very basic uh, immunology here. Um, B cells are key parts of your specific immune system. They have receptors that will bind to uh, some antigens and not others, like a lock and key mechanism. And if a particular B cell with a particular receptor binds to 
the SARS virus, it will become active and produce millions of copies of antibodies, which go through your circulation and they will bind to the virus and sort of gum it up and help your, identify, help your body identify it as foreign and help your body clear the virus from your body before it does damage to lungs or other tissues. And then in terms of the time course of a SARS infection, if day zero here is your exposure, over time you'll be asymptomatic uh, for four or five days and then you'll have more severe symptoms and then you'll start to recover a week to two weeks later and then you make a full recovery and there's no evidence of infection symptomatically for most people. But your immune system produces these immunoglobulins or antibodies and IgG is a particular class of immunoglobulin that is long lasting. It lasts for at least six months and probably a year after infection and we can detect that in the lab as a marker of prior exposure and a marker of the intensity of your immune response to vaccination or to infection. So we're taking advantage of the biology here to tell us something about a person's history of exposure. Now there's a problem with seroprevalence studies, and this is where my background as an anthropologist comes in, they require blood. You need um, blood to do an antibody test. And again, most work was done clinically in clinical settings where venous blood was being drawn from people's arms through you know, standard techniques that we've all had done. That's all fine and good, but in the context of a pandemic when everyone's being told to stay at home and shelter in place, and furthermore, we had a lot of shortage of PPE, personal protective equipment, gloves, masks, and the healthcare system was overwhelmed by acute cases of COVID, um, it wasn't a good time to ask people to come to a clinic or to a lab to give blood. Um, so that was a problem, but there is an alternative. These cards right here are called Guthrie cards. If any one in the audience has had a baby born in the US, um, right after birth, the baby's heel was pricked and a few drops of blood were put on this paper. This has been used um, for neonatal screening for, uh, since the 1960s in the United States to, con to um, screen for congenital metabolic disorders that need to be detected early. I use this as a research platform that allows me for about a dollar to get a blood sample from virtually anyone anywhere around the world just by nicking the finger with a lancet, the same type of lancets that people um, with diabetes use to monitor their blood sugar. So you collect blocks of drops of blood like this on the filter paper. Um, and it's you know convenient and easy to get the blood and people can even sample their own blood samples and then mail them to the lab. And then in the lab, we can impose, apply these laboratory methods that are, are very accurate, as accurate as they would be with the sort of gold standard clinical method of using venous blood. Hmm. So that's sort of the, the, that, this whole approach, this blood spot approach, this is the engine of my research. This is what allows me to study inflammation in the Philippines, in Bolivia, in Kenya, among other things. It's a, um, we call it a minimally invasive or field friendly approach to blood collection. And then in the lab, we um, do a lot of validation work to optimize tests using these kinds of samples. And it really, for me, what's really important about it is it, it's, it's, it facilitates an epistemological move. It allows us to get out to communities where things are happening that we think are relevant to physiology. Whereas the clinical approach requires people to come into a clinic. And by definition, you're gonna have a select group of people um, and a smaller sample of people. So this is a way to, it's a method that allows me to, and my students to do the kind of research that we like, that we want to do within, within an anthropological framework. Um, so there's a picture, Oh, sorry, Adrian, do you have a question? No, I just to state the obvious, it means you can get out into very remote places where there may not be the infrastructure for, you know, hospitals, clinics, et cetera. And I also assume it has a relevance for how great a scale. I mean, you could probably do more of these type of minimally invasive tests than you could uh, Venus tests, right? I'm guessing. That's exactly right. So it greatly facilitates our ability to collect, to collect samples from people of all ages. You know, we've collected samples from infants through you know, much older people um, mm -hmm. at very low cost. And once you collect the sample on the paper, the paper dries and preserves the blood. So you can just ship it through the regular mail. So th there's a reduced burden and cost associated with that as well. Um, so it really does expand the reach of this kind of, um, of testing. So, it, and my lab here is, you know, one of two basically in the country that really focuses on this methodology. And we do a lot of collaborative work because we want to facilitate people asking interesting questions and being able to do tests that allow them to answer them. And so I know, how does this, because we hear a lot about antigen testing, I think coming out through some private uh, enterprises now that's gonna yeah. expand, you know, Northwestern, we're offering those tests now, I assume they're antigen tests, although I don't know uh, much about it. 
Uh, how does this differ from those type of ones? That, uh, yeah, so they're really, there's two categories of testing in the COVID space. One is testing for acute infection. So you have some symptoms or, or had an exposure, you have some reason to think that you might have an infection and could spread the virus to other people. So that involves a swab of the nose typically, and then there's a PCR test, which is a molecular test that's very accurate, very precise. And that's what we have at Northwestern have been doing throughout the course of the year and other places have been doing that. There's also another category of tests. This is where we're moving now at Northwestern with this Abbott test. It's called an antigen test, but it's the same swab up the nose and yeah. you put it in a little cartridge and, and it gives you a positive or negative test. So you're testing for antigens to the virus, but you're still directly trying to test whether you have virus in your nose and could be shedding it to other people. We're doing an antibody test where we're actually quantifying your body's response to an exposure, and we call the exposure the antigen, so this is what's a little confusing, but the antibodies in the blood sample last for long periods of time, yeah. right? Um, so it's a little bit, it's a little bit different. Yeah, uh, one is more population, you know, sort of getting a picture of the, the antigens in the population. The other one is really focused on the individual. I mean, I know there's batch testing, exactly. but basically focusing on the individuals. Exactly. Uh, yeah, that's right. And some, you know, at the individual level, sometimes antibody testing is useful as well. It's not used a lot clinically, but some people come in and the doctor wants to know if this person had been previously infected with COVID and antibody tests will tell them that. Terrific. Yeah. So why don't you, could you move a little bit to the findings to share, share yeah. you know, what happened uh, when sure. you started testing people? Yeah. So this is a picture of me with my, uh, we call this my family, my panic beard in the lab in April. And uh, it was just me in the lab and it was great. I mean, no, it, was, it wasn't actually, it was, it was <laughs> fairly scary, but um, just to be out in the world, but uh, it was very productive and great for me to be in the lab and have that opportunity. And with my colleagues at Feinberg, we got a set of samples from people um, who didn't have COVID, actually old samples in our freezer collected before the pandemic, and then people who had confirmed cases of, of COVID and were able to show that our finger stick blood spot test give, gave a high result on antibodies, which you would expect. And then we were able to collect a set of samples of the gold standard serum samples, as well as the finger stick samples and our test results in basically the identical results. So that was important for us to validate this method, this approach to testing for um, COVID antibodies in finger stick blood samples. But then we had to see, could people collect sample blood from themselves? I had never done this in my own research. I had collected samples, my students had collected samples. We sent out trained RAs in the communities and they would stick people's fingers to get the blood. Now we were thinking, well, let's send kits to people in their home, have them collect their own blood and send it back to us. So I assembled this kit. This is our guest room uh, in my house where I was putting these things together and sending them out to people, dropping them off at um, friends and neighbors doors to um, uh, see if they could collect samples and then we test them in the lab. And then with that, established that it would work. People collected good samples and we could test them in the lab. We had a good dried blood spot assay for antibodies. And then the other part of the puzzle that my um, uh, colleagues at Feinberg filled in was a web platform, a web-based platform where we could have participants do informed consent, learn about the study, fill out a survey, um, and then give us their address. And then we would send them collection materials and they would send the, the materials back to the lab. So those two pieces um, together formed a no contact research platform that was particularly amenable to research in the context of a global pandemic. And that was the foundation upon which we launched SCAN. Well, let, me, let me just intervene for a second because we have a question uh, yeah. about how did you determine get people to join research by placing drops on forms and mailing them in? I guess you just answered one question. I mean, people did it. I mean, some people did, but how did you determine to whom to send it? Uh, that was yeah. Yeah, so this was the, the focus of the study was on Chicago. And initially we were very interested in answering the question, why do some neighborhoods have really high rates of COVID-19 and other rates have low rates of COVID-19? In many cases, these were adjacent neighborhoods. And so that informed our initial study design. We specifically recruited in adjacent neighborhoods in Chicago. Actually, I can show you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> ah, right there. Yeah, that, that was a good question. Um, and we, we, we focused on 10 different neighborhoods um, and the, the, they were divided into pairs and in, in the adjacent pairs were defined in such a way that one had a higher than average COVID case rate in the, in the summer and the adjacent neighborhood had a lower than average case rate. And the broader question is, why was, why was COVID-19 uh, affecting communities of color, disadvantaged neighborhoods in Chicago in particular, so much harder, where rates of infection, severe hospitalization and death were two to three times higher among Latinx and black communities in Chicago compared to white communities. One hypothesis is that, um, well, it's exposure. 
in those communities where there's uh, denser housing and people, more people living in smaller places, um, they're more likely to be exposed and transmit the virus. And as, as um, people became deemed essential, they had to venture out into the world, use public transportation, that might disproportionately affect um, people who are relatively disadvantaged, unlike people like myself who had the opportunity and privilege to work exclusively from home. So we picked these 10 neighborhoods and we, we advertised through word of mouth. We sent emails to um, uh, city council members and asked them to distribute to their constituents. We did a series of media interviews with WGN, uh, Chicago Tribune to get the word out. And we directed people to the homepage. They clicked the link to get more information. If they were interested, they signed up. And then we invited some people to participate based on their residence in some neighborhoods and basic demographics like race, gender, age, that kind of thing. Um, we initially focused on 10 neighborhoods, but we opened it up to the, to the entire Chicago land um, area shortly thereafter. And here's what we found with respect to this question of, is there a higher risk of exposure in some neighborhoods versus not? And I can just orient you to the comparison of one neighborhood pair. New City is back of the yards um, and uh, Kenwood where um, Hyde Park, where the University of Chicago is, are right here, sort of south side, but not far south side. Um, back of the yards, this community had really high rates of COVID-19, high rates of mortality. Um, Hyde Park had lower than average rates of COVID-19 and mortality. But the seropositivity, the likelihood that someone in our study tested positive for prior exposure to SARS um, was basically the same. Overall that we found in across Chicago, 19% of people in our study tested positive for exposure to the virus. So a little higher than we expected, but not super high. And there was no difference across neighborhoods. Even neighborhoods that had really high rates of COVID-19 in terms of infection, hospitalization, and even death, didn't have higher rates of exposure. So that sort of ruled out that hypothesis. It's really interesting. I'm not sure I fully understand how those two things match, but uh, let me just take a couple of questions because there's some uh, specific questions. One, which is fascinating from Gordon Scott, who said he participated in your study in SCAN. Uh, he sent in samples twice before and after vaccination. So his question is, how has the broad rollout of vaccines affected your research? Mm. Do people test positive for antibodies after being vaccinated? Absolutely. So the, the, re the research questions have shifted as the vaccines have rolled out. And I will show you uh, if we have time and there's interest, we, um, and maybe Gordon was a participant in this, in this sub-study, we reached out to participants who had early access to the vaccine because we had baseline serology, right? We had um, blood samples from them before the vaccines were available. And then we asked people to give us a blood sample after they got the first dose of the RNA vaccines and after the second dose. And we looked at patterns of response based on your exposure history. And there's some interesting results there, which, um, which I can show you. That's great. Uh, another connected question uh, is from Jerry Ezrick. What is the biological reason children are far less likely to get COVID? Uh, and did you find any data? Uh, I don't know if you were testing children, but uh, did you find anything that might illuminate that question? It's a great question, one that I'm really interested in. So uh, we did not include children in the study for IRB reasons. That was going to be a higher bar to uh, to get over, and we wanted to get into the field as quickly as possible. So everyone was IRB, for those of you who don't know, is sort of the human subject uh, ethical approval uh, system we have to go through in order to do clinical work. Yeah, yeah. And um, so all our participants were age 18 and over. However, we recently got permission to uh, sample kids as young as six, and that is that is in the field right now. So we're collecting samples from, or parents are collecting blood samples from uh, younger kids. Why are kids? Um, I mean, this is one of the silver linings, or one of the the uh, upsides of the pandemic is that kids don't seem to really uh, be at high risk for severe cases of COVID. There's some exceptions, obviously, but um, we don't have to worry about that as much. There are a couple of reasons. One is that kids have a higher level of exposure to background coronaviruses. And so by virtue of being exposed to viruses in school, daycare, other settings that are not the same as the current SARS-CoV-2 virus, but similar enough, their immune systems are sort of primed. So, so there's some idea that, that they already have some baseline immunity, even at a low level that gives them some protection. The other is that there's a key receptor that lines our epithelial tissues, you know, the tissues where we breathe in our noses and our throats and our lungs. Um, the virus gains entry through that receptor. It binds to that receptor and infects our cells through that mechanism. Children express much lower levels of that receptor. So they're, they're just less likely, they, they provide fewer entry points for the virus. 
Mm -hmm. So that's another reason. So I want to get some broader questions and ask you what you're doing next, but I have one more thing about the, the slide that's up. So I think if I understood you correctly, what you were saying is exposure rates in the adjacent neighborhoods were the same. In other words, people were exposed to the virus in the same way, and yet the outcomes were very different. Right. Uh, you know, I realize I'm asking you to speculate, but what does that suggest yeah. to you? Yeah, well, here's our um, uh, informed speculation. So, um, the first point is that in Chicago, and the, these are these are consistent with other um, seropositivity studies in New York, Bay Area, and other places. About forty percent of the infections were asymptomatic. So four out of ten people who sent us a blood sample tested positive on our antibody test, but they had no symptoms. And many of them were surprised to hear from us that they tested positive. Right. Um, so these are mild or asymptomatic infections. Two thirds of all the cases had two or fewer symptoms. So th these are relatively mild cases. So what this says is that there's a gradient of COVID-19, right? All the media coverage and all the attention has been on the mortal cases and the severe cases that lead to hospitalization. The vast majority of cases actually don't even engage much clinical care because they're mild or asymptomatic. So exposure is one thing, testing positive on our antibody test is one thing, but do you have a more serious case that might lead to hospitalization? So we found that if you have an underlying chronic condition, diabetes, hypertension, um, uh, being overweight, smoking, um, all of these things um, predict a higher symptom severity score in our study. So you have a more severe case of COVID if you have a pre-existing condition. Well, these conditions are more prevalent in disadvantaged communities that have sort of a legacy of lack of investment in key infrastructure that leads to higher rates of diabetes and hypertension, stressors associated with discrimination and poverty, those sorts of things. So poverty is sort of a pre-existing condition for more severe case of COVID. We also find that if you live with someone in your home who reports being diagnosed with COVID-19, when, when we get your antibody test back and you come back positive, we find that you are much more likely to have a more severe case. So what that suggests is that more crowded urban environments and denser living conditions provide a higher dose of exposure to the virus. You get exposed to more of it, and that leads to a more severe infection, potentially. And there are fewer opportunities for distancing and quarantining if you live in, in a crowded housing space. So those are the two factors that we think might be explaining more severe COVID, even though the baseline level of exposure seems to be relatively comparable across neighborhoods. And what implications does that have for vaccination? I remember you mentioning before we went on air that there was some sort of connection between uh, the number, you know, two doses and everything. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, there is. So maybe we could turn to that because that's an important, I think, implication of our study is that um, your exposure history does shape how you respond to the vaccine and what and, and might actually affect vaccine rollout. So there was an early report in the New York Times here um, as vaccines were starting to roll out. You know, a lot of people, unfortunately, in the United States had COVID-19, and there was this idea that they maybe didn't need the second dose of the two-dose regimen. And the idea is that for people who hadn't been exposed to COVID-19 previously, you get your one vaccine dose, and that, that primes your immune system. It sort of wakes it up and gets it used to this, um, this virus. You need a second booster dose to really ramp up to protection, to really protect you from getting reinfected and spreading the virus. Well, if you had COVID-19 as a natural infection um, prior to vaccination, you've already had that priming dose. And maybe one dose of the vaccine can then effectively function um, like the boosting dose. And so there was, there was some legitimate scientific debate about this and even some recommendations that this might be a good way forward, especially since vaccine supply was so limited early on. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that we could do in our study is that we could look at the patterns of vaccine response based on category of exposure in just a, a normal sample of people in the Chicago land area. So these aren't healthcare workers. These aren't um, severe recovered cases of COVID-19. These are everyday people. Mm -hmm. um, and we bid them as people who had a confirmed case of COVID-19, here shown on the left, people who tested seropositive on our antibody test but had a very mild infection or were asymptomatic, and then people who tested negative. And just to orient you, this is very similar to the clinical trials data that if you um, uh, had a natural infection, you have some level of immunity. This is a different antibody test. It's a measure of your body's ability to neutralize the virus in a little Petri dish. Um, and uh, you have some level baseline level of protection. But once you get your first dose, you are up at 100%, full protection. And the second dose doesn't really do much more for that, than that. 
However, if you're zero negative, let's focus on this group, you have basically have no protection before your first dose. After your first dose, you get a nice bump up. This black line is the average, but there's a big range here around 40% protection. And then it takes you the second dose to get to 100% protection. Now, what about the seropositive group? This is the interesting group because a lot of groups were saying, if you had previous exposure, and this is a previous exposure, you only need one dose. But look what happens after this first dose. You basically are indistinguishable from the seronegative group. So if you had a mild or asymptomatic case of COVID-19, our data suggests that you really need that second dose to get that full level of protection that's comparable to the group that had symptomatic COVID-19. That's fascinating. It'll be interesting as we sort of move forward through this crisis, see how long these vaccines uh, are operative and uh, whether we need boosters. I assume this type of data is going to help us track sort of what uh, that would mean. Exactly. So that's that's um, a future direction for us. So we have samples from a lot of people and we can go to send people are willing. We can reach out to them again, get another sample. We've uh, recalibrated our antibody tests in the lab to, to um, test for neutralization or you know, effectiveness at, at inhibiting uh, the emerging variants, you know, the mm -hmm. Brazilian variant, the UK variant, South African variant. So we can test the extent to which people who are vaccinated and have this profile of protection here, do they have the same profile of protection against the emerging variants? The good news is that it does seem to be mostly the case, but you know, uh, you know, if you're concerned about variants, the best thing to do is get vaccinated because the fewer people we have with active infections, the, the lower likelihood a new variant will emerge. Yeah. So there's a couple of sort of broad questions. We're going to sort of spread this out a little bit broader. One is has to do with your work around the world. Uh, and the question is, is the quality of the samples equally reliable from all around the world? For example, in the Philippines or Africa, are these samples really available from all over the world? In other words, how, you know, how does when you're doing, and I assume there's a comparative part of your work, I, it wasn't clear to me whether you work in one region and then another, or whether you're comparing regions at the same time, but what about the accuracy in the field of these type of blood uh, yeah. dot, uh, tests? Yeah, no, these are great questions. Most of my work um, is not comparative in the sense that I go to Bolivia and I go to the Philippines, I go to Kenya, get samples and then compare them. There is some of that, but that typically is not the, the design. It's more go to a place and uh, look at how different people are living in that space and how that affects their physiology. And then often we'll compare it to the US um, to gain some insight there. The, um, the finger stick samples, you put it on the filter paper and you dry it, it does a really good job of preserving the sample, but you do want to protect it. So we try to ship it back to the lab as quickly as possible. Um, some cases we don't have refrigeration or freezing in the field. So in those cases, we'll bring you know a generator or um, uh, a solar panel to keep things cool, if, particularly if it's a tropical climate, and then we'll ship things to the lab as quickly as possible. So it, these samples can degrade. So that is something we have to be careful about. But we have ways in the lab of of determining whether that's happening and ways of validating the quality of our results. Got it. So you can eliminate degraded samples. Yeah. So that helps. So Steve Bohart's asking a really interesting question. So this is a longish one, but I think it's fascinating. Is there any value to viruses in the big circle of life? For example, mosquitoes are horrible pests that spread disease, but they're also important food sources for birds, bats, and insects. Do viruses have any value besides perhaps keeping our immune system in shape? Would the world indeed be better off without viruses? Do they have any redeeming qualities? <laughs> wow, that's a deep question. Yeah. <laughs> I um, I guess I'm, I'm, I have two initial reactions. One is when I was in graduate school and sticking some immunology courses, uh, I was introduced to the phrase that viruses are trouble wrapped in protein. That they're just, you know, they, they can't do anything on their own. By definition, they need a host um, and they have to hijack the host molecular machinery to produce copies of themselves. So um, they do a lot of sneaky things. And most of the time that's benign, but in many cases, not so. Um, the other initial reaction is that over the past 10 years, there's been an explosion of research on the human microbiota or microbiome. So the, the microorganisms that live on us and in us and our bodies contain 10 times more cells of microbial origin than our that can then contain human DNA. And we're increasingly appreciating the critical they role, role they play in a lot of physiological processes, particularly related to nutrition and meta metabolism, but also the immune system. So, you know, we used to pathologize all bacteria um, and hit them hard with antibiotics, but we're now fully aware that, that most, the vast majority of those kinds of microorganisms are really important 
Many are benign and most are, are actually really important and some are really bad. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case with viruses as well, but that's sort of a new frontier that hasn't really been explored yet. And I, I, I don't know if this research is solid, maybe you heard it too, that there was some test recently on ancient uh, uh, remains uh, proving that the microbiome, or at least asserting that the, the ancient microbiome was much more diverse than the one today, yeah. which would suggest, I think along the lines Stu was suggesting that, you know, there's a dance here, you know, of what is the balance between trying to eliminate things or versus finding ways to be symbiotic with uh, the, the small world around us. Yes. Um, and yeah. so it's the same for viruses as it is for uh, bacteria, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, before we end, I, I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about your background and, uh, you know, how you, I mean, you told us a bit about your education, how you got involved in this. But you know, what is it that drives your interest in this? Is it something, is there something specific uh, that really keeps you pushing away at these problems? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a great question. And you know, I've just been reflecting a little bit more on that recently, partly pandemic, partly the stage of my career. But I, I think it's really important that we understand that human biology and health are contextualized phenomena. I mean, so much of the research we do and so much public understanding of human biology and health is based on individual factors like genes, lifestyle decisions, whether you smoke, drink, quality of healthcare, those kinds of things. Those are all really important, but a much more important determinant of how long you live is the education of your parents or the, the level of resources available to you in the communities that you grew up. And aspects of the natural world like microbes are really important to, our, to how our bodies immune systems develop and how they regulate inflammation. And so I'm interested uh, in sort of challenging clinical biomedical approaches using many of those methods, but then taking them into places like the Philippines or Bolivia where people live differently and trying to understand what, you know, what picture emerges from that kind of research program or going into neighborhoods in Chicago and trying to understand how do, how does structural racism, how do stressors um, and disadvantages associated with poverty like food insecurity, how do they affect levels of stress and uh, regulation of inflammation and ultimate cardio cardiovascular disease risk? Those are, I think, are all really important questions and key drivers of health. And to study those, you need a different methodological toolkit. And that motivates me to invest a lot of time in the lab and a lot of time collaborating with people to, who want to apply these methods to answer these kinds of questions. And I'll just mention to the audience that, you know, the college, we've been trying to figure out how to link some of these issues to do with what you might call environmental studies with health studies. In other words, mm -hmm. I think in academia, we tended to separate those things out into mm -hmm. the environment and then humans. And I think what we're finding, and this is partly because of research like that coming out of Tom's lab uh, and IPR, I have to say, has been great in this, but trying to figure out how there's that nexus between humans, the environment, and even social policy. So uh, it's a great area. Uh, it's very exciting. And so thank you, Tom, for all your work. It's really fascinating hearing about it. I'm going to draw this to a close. It's one o'clock and we're sensitive to your time. So to all of you who tuned in, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you found it a valuable way to spend 45 minutes. Uh, and thank you so much to our alumni and leadership circle supporters of Weinberg College, who's investments in us make research like Tom's possible. So thank you again to all of you. Thank you, Tom. And you. I hope you have a great day.